right here on GreatLakesNow.org. And joining me right now is David Sweetnam. He's the executive director of Georgian Bay Forever from Ontario. David, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. So tell us, what is this organization? Georgian Bay Forever is a charity that was founded in about 1995. Mm -hmm. That started to look at water quality in the eastern and northern coast of uh, Georgian Bay, which mm -hmm. is fairly remote and wasn't getting a lot of attention. Um, a lot of cottagers and the, the communities up there really wanted to see what was happening to the water quality. Mm -hmm. And so we started off doing, uh, really designing the water quality monitoring programs that would be put in place there. That's evolved over the years because one of the big things that's impacted water quality in those areas in the coastal embayments is actually the low water levels that hit. Mm -hmm. And so for the past 13 years, that link between water quality and water quantity has been the main focus for our organization. So. Whenever I talk to anybody from organizations uh, having to deal with Great Lakes causes, I always know that there's a story behind why people get involved in advocating for the lakes and advocating for the cleanliness of the areas. I guess what's your story or your connection to the water that has made you so passionate about this? When I was uh, 16, I went to summer camp on Georgian Bay, but at 17, I actually worked in the National Park as part of the uh, Junior Warden Program. Really? And just got that con connectivity, got the, the connection. <laughs> yeah, I never really thought about it for years after that. Like, you know, I would recreate up there and, and uh, canoe and camp and boat. But it wasn't until about uh, four years ago when this organization really started to re-engineer itself and become a science-based uh, organization that they went looking for an executive director. And I happened to see the uh, posting. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, George and Bay, I'm up there all the time anyway. I could actually get paid to go out and, uh, and protect the environment. So that's, that's when I started working with the organization. A major connection, too, for, for so many people when you can kind of meet them at that level of the love of the lakes and, and, and being able to use them. Water quality and the cleanliness of the water is so important um, to many people. How do you go about in getting your message out there? I, that's a difficult thing. Um, even after an intensive period of time, the uh, district of Muskoka up in, in that area uh, spent a lot of money on radio advertisements and print advertisements. After flooding the marketplace up there, they only had a 5% awareness of the issue in the general population. Why do you think it's so difficult? Well, it's, it's difficult with the, the inland population because the economies, you know, really it's driven by um, the uh, recreational fishing, mm -hmm. um, tourism, a lot of those industries uh, that used to be there aren't anymore. But the coastal community has a very high awareness of this. The people that are out in, in water see access only communities, mm -hmm. they see it, they live with it, they have a hard time getting to their cottages now, et cetera, so it's very easy. But connecting those two communities, as kind of a, a real communications challenge. It's yeah. a challenge that a lot of people have talked about. You're not the only mm -hmm. one when we, when we sit here and we talk about some of these issues. Talk to me about being here in Cleveland for Great Lakes Week. Who are you hoping to interact with and um, what have you kind of heard so far that's piqued your interest? Well, we, I like to interact with both the uh, you know, policy makers mm -hmm. and also with the scientific community and the people that are here on the ground doing work because our focus is on education and scientific research. So we actually fund a lot of the research still that's done up in that area. Mm -hmm. And take that and then bring it back to policymakers and say this is you know, some new information. Um, for example, this summer we're working on blue-green algae blooms and actually the causes for those blooms. At low oligotrophic levels, like we have up in uh, Church and Bay, very low nutrient concentrations, we're actually still seeing blue-green algae blooms. And it's not explicable directly by the phosphorus linkage. So we're looking Which at some. Which was what they're talking about here all the times and pointing it and pointing at Lake Erie. Yeah, it's a predominant driver down here. That's mm -hmm. right. But the the question up there was, well, why are we still seeing these blooms when we don't have that same level of phosphorus? And we're trying to really figure out what the mechanisms behind those bloom triggers are. But then come down and make you know res or the policymakers aware of that kind of information because it's not it's new, it's not published. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not really uh, generally available in the literature yet. There's only one paper so far that's published, but we'll be publishing that kind of research. You make an important point, I think, with linking some of the science that, that people are doing to the policymakers, because you can sit and you can do studies all day long, but if you're not starting to equate it to the people who have the resource and the power to be able to do something to an act and change about it, then, then you're stuck. That's it, and, and nothing really is going to change, right? People will still be applying the same models and the same way of solving uh, you know, the problems and they won't have this new information that really shows them that there might need to be some differences, uh, different approaches put in place. So have you been able to, um, I guess, experience some of the coordination between the U.S. government and the Canadian government? Again, sometimes we take for granted that we're along the Great Lakes Basin and we think just the U.S., but no. we know our friends in Canada, oh, yeah. that it affects you as, as well. Yeah, no, much. absolutely. In fact, some of the most uh, uh, 
high-level environmentalists I've ever met are actually working on the front lines for the Canadian government and mm -hmm. the uh, provincial government. So yeah, there's a very high high degree of coordination, I think, between those organizations. The IJC, of course, is uh, overseeing a lot of the information that's flowing back and forth and the science that's been done in the last four years on the Upper Great Lakes studies has really been quite exceptional. So we've learned a lot more about the system, but we understand that there's still some gaps in mm -hmm. that knowledge pool. Yep. And with the economic environment being what it is, you know, a charity like ourselves is actually a source of funding for these research projects. So we can look at it, do a gap analysis, figure out what's missing, and then come as a partner to the table with some money and say, look, we'll actually fund some of these research uh, studies that need to be done to advise the policy in a little better way. So. Great thing to point out. We had talked about this earlier on today when we talk about funding for restoration and, and, and to troubleshoot some of the problems. We talk a lot about the government funding and maybe don't spend enough time talking about the foundations and the charities and some of the companies that do step up and say, hey, we're willing to give some dollars to clean up as well. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the biggest funding that we've received has been from uh, the, the RBC and the uh, Blue Water Fund, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that has enabled us to actually go out and do four studies this, this summer. Those four studies, it's more research than, be, than is being done at the uh, provincial or the, uh, the federal level in Georgian Bay right now. So we're actually the primary source of information that's flowing out of that region. And that is important for us to kind of bring to the table and make sure we communicate that effectively. So as a young organization, you know, mm -hmm. really we're just trying to, to uh, provide our value and make that value proposition to the partners that we have with the federal governments on both sides of the border, the institutions like the IJC, and then the actual agencies that are on the ground. The second thing about coming here is great to connect with some of the other on the ground uh, organizations and see what kind of challenges lay before us. For example, in Georgian Bay, when the water levels have declined, we've had a loss of coastal wetlands. So I was just at a seminar a minute ago, uh, or five minutes ago now, um, where they were actually talking about how they had some success with diking wetlands for a couple of years, draining the water down, letting them reconstitute themselves, and then reconnecting them hydrologically. Mm -hmm. But where we are in Georgian Bay attempting, there's no dredge sediments, we can't, uh, it's har hard bedrock and it drops right. off quite precipitously. So applying those techniques doesn't work and we don't necessarily want to have to come in and be pouring concrete dikes and so on. So trying to figure out how do we deal with that kind of a challenge when those coastal wetlands have reduced the fish habitat. <coughs> We'd really like to recreate that fish habitat and help uh, northern pike come back in some places that have largely disappeared. Mm -hmm. How do we actually go about doing that? So. I threw that challenge out and people are going, yeah, that's a really yeah, you know, that's good a question. Well, let's uh, <laughs> let's try to figure out a way of looking at that. And yeah. yeah, so those connections I think are really important for this kind of uh, event for us too. Well, David yeah. Sweetenham, good luck and Thank congratulations you. on the success you've had so far. And I know that you have much more work ahead of Thank you. you. Thanks we for do. joining us and great.